This is Big Ideas in 7th Grade Social Studies, updated for the Georgia Standards of Excellence. This is all of the big concepts that we cover, all of them, in the Standards for 7th Grade Social Studies. Let's start in Southwest Asia, also known as the Middle East. Now, from time to time, you're going to see an embedded video like this inside of, well, inside of this video. You can access this by either going to the Interactive Prezi, which is linked in the video description here, or you can find a link to this video directly in the description. This one is a video that will teach you about the map features of Southwest Asia, all of the political and physical features we need to know for our standards. So let's talk about some of the big geography concepts. Now, one thing we're supposed to be able to do in seventh grade is to be able to tell the difference between an ethnic group and a religious group. A religious group is a group of people who share the same beliefs. These are typically spiritual beliefs that have to do with what God you worship, what happens to your soul after you die, and so forth. An ethnic group, on the other hand, is based on shared culture, history, race, and sometimes language. In Southwest Asia, we find the three big monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. This is where they all originated. And they have a number of things that make them similar. The biggest one, of course, is that all three are monotheistic. That is, they believe in only one God. And all three, in fact, claim to worship the God of Abraham. Judaism, of course, was founded by Abraham. That was the first of these three. Then came Christianity, uh, started by Jesus, and Islam founded by Muhammad. All three consider the city of Jerusalem to be sacred. We learn about several different ethnic groups in Southwest Asia as well. The Arabs are the largest ethnic group in Southwest Asia, with their culture originating on the Arabian Peninsula. They live throughout Southwest Asia and North Africa. Persians come from Iran which is the largest Shia Muslim country in the world. The Kurds live in the mountains of northern Iraq, Iran, Syria, and Turkey. Because they don't have one country of their own, they have been fighting to become their own independent country. That is a function of nationalism. And unfortunately, that has created some conflict with the different countries that we find Kurds living in. Now, remember that there is a diversity of religions in any ethnic group, although these three are predominantly Muslim. There are a number of different environmental problems affecting Southwest Asia. The biggest one probably is water pollution. This is the result of either untreated sewage or the petroleum industry. And this problem, uh, you know, this creates a shortage of drinking water, and there's not a lot of drinking water in this region to begin with. And it's a particularly difficult problem to solve because water pollution typically involves shared water sources, such as the Jordan River. And trying to solve the problem involves coordinating between different countries, some of whom may not be on the best of terms with one another. A persistent economic problem in the region is that water and oil resources are not evenly distributed. Some countries in Southwest Asia are oil rich and therefore wealthy countries with high GDPs and high standards of living. Other countries there do not have that kind of a resource and are oil poor. This creates a lot of resentment between richer countries and poorer countries and, and quite a bit of conflict results from that. Additionally, water is not evenly distributed. There are only a few uh, major sources of fresh water, including the, the major rivers, the Jordan, the Euphrates, and the Tigris, and not every country has access to those rivers. Let's talk about some history. So the history of Southwest Asia really starts with the partition after World War I. Southwest Asia had been part of the Ottoman Empire for hundreds of years after World War I, all the Ottoman land was taken by the British and the French, and it was partitioned into new countries using artificial borders. Now, these artificial borders end up creating a, a lot of conflict between ethnic and religious groups. And this includes the conflict between the Kurds and their neighbors, and of course, conflicts between the Sunnis and the Shias. Another major feature of the history of Southwest Asia is the establishment of the State of Israel. 
State of Israel was established for a variety of reasons. First of all, Jewish people had a religious connection to the land. This is the land that Jews believe was given to them by God in the covenant of the Old Testament. There's also a thing called Zionism. Zionism was this political movement to get Jews who had been scattered in the diaspora all throughout the world to return to their ancestral homeland. There was also some uh, negative things that were pushing them to establish a country of their own. For many, many years, Jews had to experience horrible anti-Semitism, anti-Jewish racism. And the worst expression of that, of course, comes about in the form of the Holocaust in World War II, when the Nazis murdered six million of them in concentration camps. Now, the United States is actually featured in a bit of more recent history in the Middle East because the U.S. was involved in several wars there. First of these is the Persian Gulf War in 1990. This was caused by Iraq invading the small oil-rich country of Kuwait, and the United States fought this war to get Iraq out. Then, of course, the war in Afghanistan in 2001. This was a result of the terror attacks on 9-11, the United States went into Afghanistan to destroy al-Qaeda, the perpetrators of that attack, and to find their leader, Osama bin Laden. And then there was the Iraq War in 2003. The United States invaded Iraq to prevent Saddam Hussein from building weapons of mass destruction. It turns out they, in fact, weren't doing that, but we invaded nevertheless. Let's talk about government. Before I proceed, you should know that there is some important government vocabulary that you're going to need to know for seventh grade. I've got a couple of videos here that can help you with that. The first one here is covering the concept of citizen participation. We also have a great video here that helps to compare and contrast parliamentary and presidential systems of government. So are there are three countries that we learn about in seventh grade in terms of government. The first one is Saudi Arabia. Now, it's called the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and that's because it's an absolute monarchy. And in an absolute monarchy, a king or other member of royalty rules the country, and there is very little freedom and very little citizen participation. Israel, on the other hand, is democratic. It's a parliamentary democracy where the citizens elect their representatives to the legislature, or in the case of Israel, they call that the Knesset. And then those representatives choose the leader of the country called a prime minister. Turkey is also a democracy, but not as democratic as other democracies. Now, Turkey has a presidential system. They are a presidential democracy, but their president in recent years has been ruling more as an authoritarian president. They are technically democratic, but citizens do not have as many rights as they have in the past in Turkey. On to Africa. So here we have another really good map video. This one is by Maddie and Ty. Okay, let's talk about Africa's geography. So one thing we talk about in Africa are the four major climate regions. Now, by the way, climate regions are called biomes in science, and this particular section of our standards overlaps with science standard S7L4. There are four major biomes that we learn about. There's the Sahara Desert that dominates North Africa. Very few people, of course, live in the Sahara Desert. There's the Sahel region. This is a semi-arid region that runs just below. It's a narrow strip that runs just below the Sahara Desert. And the largest climate region in Africa is the savannas, the grassland region. That's the, that's the area that supports the most people because that's where you have the most farmland. And we also have a large tropical rainforest in Africa, especially in the equatorial regions near Central Africa. Now, Africa is actually extremely rich in natural resources. And these are just a few of the natural resources you can find in Africa. We have gold, diamonds, and uranium in South Africa, minerals of various types, including some very valuable ones that we need in the high-tech sector. Those minerals can be found in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. There's enormous amounts of farmland in various parts of the Savannah region. And there is oil in Nigeria and Sudan. 
we learn about some of the different ethnic groups in Africa. Now, there are many, many, many ethnic groups, but in seventh grade, we learn about four of them. Those include the Arabs, who live in North Africa. The Bantu, largest ethnic group, lived throughout sub-Saharan Africa, more of a language group than an ethnic group. The Ashanti, who live in West Africa, in Cameroon and the Swahili who live along the eastern coast. As with other ethnic groups, there is a diversity of religions among the ethnic groups in Africa. The Arabs and the Swahili are predominantly Muslim, while the Bantu and the Ashanti practice a combination of traditional African religions and some Christianity. Now, Africa suffers from some environmental problems as well. A lot of this is tied to the rapidly growing population and, in many places, poor soil. This leads to both deforestation and desertification. Poor soil will lead to deforestation through slash-and-burn agriculture, which makes the soil viable for a couple of cycles of crops. The rising population can also lead to desertification. As people are pressed to produce more and more food, they have to stress the land through overcultivation, overgrazing, and of course, if the soil becomes damaged, that can lead to desertification. Desertification, by the way, is especially bad in the Sahel region, which of course is halfway to being a desert already. Some other notable features of the continent. The Sahara Desert, by the way, is so big that it actually divides the continent culturally. The culture of North Africa and the culture of Sub-Saharan Africa is substantially different. The Nile River, by the way, is the world's longest river, and Africa is in fact the second largest continent in the world. Let's learn some history. So in seventh grade, we start studying the history of Africa with European colonization. So in the end of the 1800s, we have a thing called the Scramble for Africa. This is when European countries move in to colonize basically the entire continent. They wanted a number of things from Africa, including their natural resources, markets to sell their goods. They wanted to be able to spread their religion. They wanted prestige and bragging rights. And they end up having this meeting called the Berlin Conference, where all these different European countries sit down and divide up Africa and decide who gets what part. And, of course, Africans were not involved in this meeting. The resulting borders that are drawn by the Europeans are artificial borders. And, as we've learned before, artificial borders lead to conflict. Africans, of course, don't like being colonized. And eventually, the Pan-Africa movement begins to develop which encourages Africans to develop a sense of nationalism and a willingness to work together to fight for their independence. And throughout the 1950s, the 1960s, and the 1970s, all of these African colonies become independent countries. The process was very peaceful in Nigeria through a political process, and a lot of countries followed the Nigerian model of independence. Some countries followed the Kenyan model, which was actually a violent revolution, a violent revolt. When South Africa became independent, they continued to be controlled by the white minority population. These were the descendants of the original European colonists called Afrikaners. Now, the Afrikaner government in South Africa establishes a system of racial separation called apartheid. This is actually modeled after segregation in the United States, except much, much worse. Many people, including Nelson Mandela and the African National Congress, fight very hard against this apartheid racism. The international community refused to let South African athletes participate in the Olympics. Foreign countries refused to trade with South Africa. Eventually, the last white president of South Africa, F.W. Clerk, sits down with Nelson Mandela, and they work to find an end to apartheid. All three of the governments that we learn about in Africa, Kenya, South Africa, and Nigeria, all three of these countries have democratic governments. Nigeria has a presidential democracy. And in a presidential democracy, your citizens vote separately for both the president and the legislature. Though there is some corruption and some limitations on individual freedoms, Kenya does have a good functioning democracy. South Africa has a parliamentary democracy. And in a parliamentary democracy, the citizens elect their representatives to the legislature, and those representatives choose the leader of the country. 
Confusingly, South Africa calls their leader a president. That doesn't make them a presidential system. It's their country. They can choose to call their prime minister whatever they want, and they choose to call their leader the president. And South Africa, by the way, is considered a model for democracy and freedom in Africa. Lots of freedom, lots of citizen participation. Nigeria is very similar to Kenya. It is a presidential democracy, and of course your citizens vote separately for both the president and the legislature. And like Kenya, it is respected as a functioning democracy, although there is some corruption and some limits on individual freedom. Now on the subject of corruption, unstable governments and corrupt dictators can make many of the problems in Africa much worse. Problems like civil wars, problems like famines, diseases like HIV and AIDS, lack of access to education. These are all problems that are either caused by unstable governments or made much worse because an unstable government is unable to deal with those problems. On to Southern and Eastern Asia. Okay, we have another mapping video here for you. This one is by Venya and Rasa. So let's talk about some of the major geography ideas in Southern and Eastern Asia. In seventh grade, we talk about some of the major belief systems in Southern and Eastern Asia, including Hinduism, Buddhism, Shinto, and Confucianism. Hinduism originates in India and focuses on karma and reincarnation. Buddhism is also a reincarnation-based religion, and in Buddhism, the focus is on ending suffering. Shintoism is a nature-based religion originating in Japan and features the worship of spirits called kami. And you'll also see Shinto rituals heavily involved in sumo wrestling, by the way. Confucianism is not technically a religion, but is a philosophy based on the philosopher Confucius. Confucianism is seeking to make society a better, smoother, more peaceful place through proper behavior. Now, among the environmental problems that we learn about in Southern and Eastern Asia are air pollution, water pollution, and flooding. Now, air and water pollution in Southern and Eastern Asia is largely the product of rapid industrialization and also population growth. Rapid industrialization means that a lot of new factories have been built in Asia in the last couple of decades. And those factories, of course, are where they're making all of our stuff. And as a result of this, these new factories are putting out a lot of particulates, a lot of pollution into the air. Now, water pollution in China is a similar story. With all this rapid industrialization, all these new factories are putting a certain amount of waste into the rivers of China. That industrial waste, not good for people. In India, the largest source of water pollution is untreated sewage, especially in the Ganges River. Flooding is also a problem in the region. In India, most of the flooding comes from a thing called monsoons. Monsoons are these seasonal winds that bring enormous amounts of rain. Monsoon rains result in flooding in a lot of areas. The good news is that monsoon flooding brings a lot of silt to help renew farmland. The bad news, of course, is it destroys villages and destroys people's homes. In China, the flooding comes from very, very powerful rivers that originate high in the mountains. A couple of notable features. Asia is the world's largest continent, and the monsoon seasonal winds bring enormous amounts of rain and floods. Okay, let's talk about some history in Southern and Eastern Asia. Now, at the end of World War II, the United States helped to rebuild Japan. Remember that Japan was destroyed pretty much in the war. And the U.S. rebuilds Japan's economy and helps to set up a new government. As a result, Japan's economy turned around very, very quickly. They went from devastation to having one of the strongest economies in the world, frequently referred to as an economic miracle. And this happens despite the fact that Japan has very few natural resources. It relies heavily on its highly educated workforce. We also spend some time learning about India. For hundreds of years, India was a colony of the British. Mohandas Gandhi and the Indian National Congress lead Indians to resist British rule. Now, Gandhi, also known as Mahatma Gandhi, is famous for popularizing the idea of non-violent civil disobedience. This is resisting the government, resisting what you think are unfair or 
unethical laws, but doing it without actually using any violence. Now, it takes many years, but in 1948, India wins its independence from the British. Unfortunately, because of sectarian differences, differences between Hindus and Muslims, India is partitioned into two countries, India and Pakistan. India for Hindus and Pakistan for Muslims. We also spend some time learning about the disastrous history of communism in China, initially led by the dictator Mao Zedong, including the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, and the Tiananmen Square Massacre. Now, the Great Leap Forward, this was Mao's attempt to increase industrial production in China by making everyone produce steel in their backyard. Not only does their plan fail, 20 million people starve to death. And then there's the Cultural Revolution, where the population of China is terrorized while Mao uses young people called Red Guards to try to re-secure his power. And then in 1989... The Chinese government kills thousands of pro-democracy demonstrators in Tiananmen Square, reminding the people of China and the world that it continues to be a brutal authoritarian country. Now, the United States fought some wars in Asia as part of our mission to contain the spread of communism. Now, remember that this time period is during the Cold War. American foreign policy was heavily focused on preventing communism from spreading around the world. In both the Korean War and the Vietnam War, the United States fought to defend a non-communist country in the South from communist invasions from the North. And in the Korean War, although it ends in a stalemate with a border about the same place that it was at the beginning, in the Korean War we can say that we did successfully contain the spread of communism. In the Vietnam War, though, the communist North Vietnam eventually conquers South Vietnam and unifies the country under communist rule. So three of the governments that we learn about in Southern and Eastern Asia are democratic and two of them are decidedly autocratic. Now Japan has a constitutional monarchy as their system of government. Now, while there is a monarch, there is an emperor, this emperor is purely ceremonial. So Japan is democratic. They function as a parliamentary system. And in Japan, there is lots of freedom and lots of citizen participation. India also has a parliamentary system. They call themselves a federal republic. And in fact, they are considered the largest democracy in the world, also with lots of freedom and lots of citizen participation. Although at the time of this recording, there are some problems in India in terms of freedom of religion. South Korea also has a very stable and successful parliamentary democracy, which emphasizes individual rights and political accountability. China, on the other hand, is a communist state. Now, keep in mind that while China still follows communism in their governmental system, they really do not follow communist economic philosophy anymore. While at various times an argument can be made that China has had an oligarchic government, the more recent government of China is clearly an authoritarian one with one leader in power. And so that's why we would classify China as a dictatorship. And of course, while they do have a lot of uh, economic freedom, in terms of political freedom, there is none. No political freedom, no citizen participation in China. North Korea is one of the last truly communist countries left in the world. And it is, in fact, a model of oppressive, brutal communist dictatorship. There's no way to overstate how bad this government is. Not only do people live in poverty and live under constant surveillance and constantly oppressed by their government, people in, in North Korea are in fact expected to worship their leaders like they were gods. So there you have it. All the big ideas in seventh grade social studies. This has been Mr. Parker. Thank you for watching.